and we're live hello hello everybody welcome to fluent friday as always with me kirsten from fluentlanguage.co.uk you may be noticing if you are eagle-eyed that i am still moving around a little bit in my new home to try and find the best place to broadcast to you from facebook live so please you know leave me a message or give me a like and say how you like our setup today and I'm going to be straight into today's topic. I thought it was a really, really interesting one. It was inspired by a post that Enrique made here in the Fluent Language Learners group. So Enrique is um, based in Florida, from what I understand from his post, and posted about being unable to decide which language to learn next. His choices are Arabic, Egyptian dialect, Mandarin or German. So on the surface uh, those languages don't necessarily have that much in common and I find it very very interesting that you're sort of faced with that choice and you're really thinking well what should I learn you know like the, there's more I guess there's more Mandarin speakers where I live and but at the same time I already know a bit of German vocab so isn't German going to be easier for me or should I be learning Arabic because really that's 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 what I want but but isn't it going to be difficult and what's the point of learning Arabic when nobody speaks Arabic around me so there's all these questions in our minds and today in the Facebook live I thought let's do a bit of untangling and get into the answers to these questions so before I go into a lot of more detail first I want to acknowledge and I think just take a mim minute to realize how lucky how lucky we are if our questions in language learning are about which language should I learn next because that usually implies that you already speak English. It is a bit of a luxury problem and I think that's a wonderful thing. So it's nothing to be uh, embarrassed or feeling negative about but how cool um, that you have this amazing language learning choice. And how cool that there are so many languages and so many different cultures in today's world that are open to us. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and say, hey, yay globalization, I suppose, you know. So that's a, a good thing in my book. Uh, and it's also a bit of a polyglot problem. So polyglots tend to have, tend to be the people who love language. And to me, if you're watching this, doesn't matter if you're fluent in five languages or whatever. I don't subscribe to this um, BS list that I once saw about like you need to speak four languages fluently to be a polyglot. I think if you love learning languages and you just kind of have a drive to do it and you're actually doing it instead of just standing at the bus stop and saying, oh, one day I'll learn French. If that's who you are, then you are to a certain extent a polyglot because otherwise I wouldn't be either. So it's also a bit of a polyglot problem because they are the people that I certainly meet that do have the language shopping lists, you know. So if you're the language wish list person like me, you know, I've got like Vietnamese, Luxembourgish, oh, but also Icelandic and oh, I did Russian once and I really should get back. And there's just so many wonderful languages out there. So this, this it is a bit of a problem. And before we get into this, I also want to address um, the option that some people take as a solution of learning just why not just learn all of them at once and I do want to acknowledge that that is is certainly possible I have at different parts different points in my life been studying um, I think I studied English French Spanish at the same time and then before that I did English French and Latin I sort of kept English and French always kept them and then could just the third language kind of changed um, and even now I, I do maintenance work in French while still learning Welsh and every now and then I give a little wink to Spanish and realize how unsexy my Spanish is. <laughs> so you can learn more than one language at once. I would discourage you from trying to start unless you really have a lot of time and a lot of you know motivation to start from zero with two languages at once, especially if they are unrelated to each other. So if you want to do something like Arabic and Chinese, don't do them at the same time. 
unless you unless that's like your full-time job and you really can dedicate a lot of time to it but otherwise I think it's better to get a solid foundation and then to sort of play around with the side language and you know see see what comes next my tendency seems to be to study for about two or three years in one language and then I either move on or I, I start adding other things into it so coming to having sort of said all that coming to I have um, four questions that I sort of saw in Enrico's thoughts and that I kind of see discussed around the web or in, in conversations so I kind of want to address those four questions question number one how easy are you going to find the language should you learn the language that is just going to be easiest and one of my mantras is that there aren't really easy and hard languages but there are languages that will take you longer to make progress or it won't take you as long to make progress so there is a level of sense in that you know really thinking about how fast you can make progress and that depends on how motivated you are by progress and how motivated you are by the f rewarding feeling or on the other hand how motivated you are by curiosity and challenge and discovering a, a world and a way of thinking that is totally different to your own so if you're learning German you do have to see the world in slightly different ways but if you but you don't have to do your all your sentences back to front like um, a forum member recently or a Facebook group member recently described about Korean so it is there is a level of circular motivation in this and circular motivation essentially means that you will feel motivated to do something you will feel the reward of that you know you sort of achieve your goal because you were motivated in the first place and then that goal hitting that goal milestone motivates you to get to the next milestone you kind of are like a frog with the the leapfroggy lily pads this is a very weird analogy but you know you jump from lily pad to lily pad to lily pad and stay stay highly motivated so this is a great way to be sustainable but if you're doing a language only because you think it's going to be easy and that is the only thing that really interests you about it unfortunately you're not going to find it all that easy you're going to find it's not actually as easy as you thought because that is the truth of language learning so this is a it can be a linguistic motivation but if there is no not that intrinsic motivation your interest your desire your you know like connection with that language it can be a personal you know a person it can be a group of people it can be some internal desire to uncover that language and that way of thinking if that's not there then it doesn't matter how easy or difficult the language is so between those three languages that you mentioned I think you should not pick what you think will be easiest excuse me my camera just fell over <laughs> how are you guys doing now number two the second question is, who are you going to speak to, right? Does it matter if you learn a language and you don't know a single person who speaks that language? And for me, personally, um, it, it doesn't really m matter because I think I'm going to meet those people. Like, I don't need the person right there in front of me, but I can see how it's a lot easier when you feel that you, you'll have an easier time connecting with people in that language. But then I had Russian-speaking friends and was in a you know in an evening class for Russian really connecting with Russian learners and Russian speakers and still in the end chose to uh, you know stop learning Russian or you know put Russian on the back burner and start learning Welsh because the the desire just was was there the curiosity for Welsh was stronger now the question of who you're going to speak to is a really great one because on the plus side it's really rewarding to be able to speak to people in your foreign language that's why we do it we're, we're here to connect with people we we want to you know we want to feel that sometimes you want to chat to a girl that's a question or you have a partner in a different language or you might just you know be interested in a different community around where you live so having people to speak to it's it can be super rewarding and also makes it easier to make that language a habit if you have a regular standing appointment or even just like hey the guy in the coffee shop is Vietnamese I'll speak to him in the morning in Vietnamese 
you've got that regular appointment going, fantastic. You know, that makes it easier to have it. The downside is that people come into your life, people can come out of your life. So you don't want to um, just, I know Stephen, I know you said, date the people whose languages you want to learn and I think that's true and I think that's valid but then at the same time you don't want to just just have that one focus because if that relationship stops then your language learning journey stops and usually languages are spoken by more than one person so there's that so the other downside of that of um, just focusing on speaking to people is that it's easy especially at the start to overestimate what you're going to be able to do in a certain amount of time and to underestimate how difficult it is to speak to people at speed at their native language speed so you have to have a high tolerance to feeling like an idiot in scientific terms and so that's that's kind of what I think so out of those two easy language or spoken commonly spoken language I'd almost go with easy because this is modern life and we're all on the internet and you're obviously on the internet in Rike so um, I think out of those two I would I would trust that when I start learning the language I'm going to find the people and um, number three will you travel there now for me that is a huge motivation for you it might be the same it's such a wonderful vision goal I'll go later into into what a vision goal is is all about but for me the will you travel there and how realistic is this and is this your big dream are you motivated to travel there even with languages like Latin you can go to language camps where people just speak Latin believe it or not so you know will you will this be a big part of enriching your life I think that could be a great motivator however it's not really that much use in terms of taking action because I bet you know a lot of people who want to travel to China and speak Chinese and very few of them are actually doing something about it. Uh, finally, the big language learning motivation. So we have talked about the ease or difficulty of a language. We have talked about do you know people who speak that language. We've talked about will you travel there. And then there's number four. Um, I'll tell you a story about my cool nail varnish in a minute <laughs> but there's number four and that is the pure outright burning excited attraction to a language and I think we could all see it in Enrique's question so if you scroll back through the group and you have a look at Enrique's question later you will see that he says well I I love Arabic music and I'm actually most interested in Arabic but I'm worried you know I won't meet the people and stuff like that so that outright attraction, that fascination with the sounds in a language, with the story of a language, you know, like I'm thinking of my podcast co-host Lindsay Dow, Lindsay Williams, who changed her name over a year ago and I'm still getting it wrong, my podcast co-host Lindsay Williams, who is learning Guarani, partly because she's traveling there, but who then also became kind of more and more interested in the language and the interesting status of Guarani. Or I'm thinking about my own fascination with the Welsh language, you know, which I sort of encountered on little trips. I really don't need to speak Welsh to get by in the UK. Come on. Uh, however, there's just something about the sounds and the spellings and what the words look like that really attracted me. And also that feeling of being able to speak a second official language of the country where I live. Is super cool it's super cool and it motivates me and that was just pure outright attraction that nobody can really replicate and society doesn't you know like you don't go to the bookstore and you see teach yourself Welsh the second official language and you will you know be proud it's just not what people think motivates us so however if you've got that burning desire if you've got that curiosity that fascination the, desire, the love of Arabic music, for example, you seek more contact with the language, you find more people who speak that language, and you start enjoying the journey more. And all of those are great motivators to keep going, and we know that the only way to learn a language successfully is to not stop learning a language. The downside, because there's a downside to everything, is that you seem a little bit unusual. People might think you're weird. People might 
not quite understand. It's not as e it's not, it's just not the standard kind of dinner party. Oh yeah, I'm I'm moving to China. That's why I'm learning Chinese. You know, it's more like I love Chinese. But at the same time, isn't that a wonderful conversation starter? And isn't that something to be proud about and be excited about? So I think you at any point in life have got full permission to learn whatever language you wish to learn regardless of how many people speak it or how easy or hard it is or how ready you are. You know, we've got people in this group who are studying ancient Greek. We've got people in this group who are studying Sanskrit. Those languages you could think, oh my God, it's going to be so difficult and oh, and I've got no use for it. But it's about your personal life. Your life and your motivation is yours. So ultimately, you can pick whatever you want regardless of what for lack of a better word, society tells us will be useful. I see this a lot in, in schools or even among people who just would like to learn a language and kind of toying around with the idea. They often think, oh, well, I did, I did a little bit of French in school and so now that I'm 29, I, I should really learn French again because I did a little bit before. But these are people who spent all their holidays, say, in Turkey who love perhaps, or in Greece, and love Greek food, or Turkish food, or people who just have a massive, massive affinity for manga. And, you know, there's, there's just a much more obvious choice for them, and they're kind of fascinated by something else, but they think they should. And if you think you should, then that's really, really tricky. So that's my, my number one tip out of all of this, and I'm going into my pro tips now, um, is don't get shoddy, because that just doesn't work. Now, that's really my first tip here, is like that sometimes we hold back because we think we can't um, attach to an external reason like careers or partners or people or this language is easy or school taught me this before or my society speaks this. Sometimes we hold back from indulging a passion and that's not really what for most people modern language learning should be entirely about you know if you've got a strong desire a strong passion then just go with that however if you've got a need that doesn't mean you won't discover your passion along the way so always stay open to indulging your passions and just learning in the way that you think is the most fun if you love arabic music follow that you know desire you know watch documentaries about it incorporate it in your in your language learning routine and if that means your um, hello is this seat taken can I smoke in here kind of textbook nonsense falls by the wayside so what doesn't matter does not matter and if you want to get a language exchange partner who maybe plays an Arabic instrument or is just you know will just have you talk about that one topic again and again and again until you learn all of the vocab and you're like music fluent and that still means you can't quite go to the supermarket? Who cares? I think that doesn't matter because it's about what keeps you going. You're not in full-time education anymore. That gives you the added responsibility, risk, what should we call it, that you can drop out of this at any time. And we don't want you to drop out of this because that's not the way to learn a language. And at the end of the day, you want to be able to say, I can speak. Tip number two, and I think this is really important. You are not married to a language for life. You're allowed to flirt, to be, <laughs> for lack of a better word, polylinguist. You can try and learn and speak as many languages as you like, and you've got a whole lifetime to do it. So if you decide to go with Arabic now, and you're worried that that will take away from your Chinese study time, don't worry about it because in a year you can change your mind, you can switch around and that's absolutely fine. You don't have to either complete the language. You can take whatever it is you came for. And I was, I'm really speaking from experience here, I was agonizing over this quite a bit when I switched from Russian to Welsh. And I really wondered, well I haven't, you know, like I haven't completed Russian, I haven't um, learned enough Russian, I can't have a conversation in Russian except if it's, you know, a very structured, you know, like, what did you have for breakfast da, 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 after a breakfast class? You know, I have to really 
I kind of had to script it out still. And I just, but what I had come to Russian for was kind of my curiosity really drove me to learning Cyrillic. I wanted to learn the Cyrillic alphabet. I was really curious about it. I wanted to learn how, how Russian is pronounced. I wanted to be able to say things and, you know, like be the person who can say things like I don't know. <laughs> even even New Gavriu Poruski, which just means I don't speak Russian, but hey, I can say it. And it's kind of a cool feeling to say something in Russian. But that was kind of all I'd come for at that point. And it, I didn't feel the high motivation to go further. And then at that point decided, look, I've dabbled in Russian and that is okay because nobody's grading me. And same way, Enrique, I don't think anybody is grading you. You're allowed to change your mind. You're allowed to have affairs. You're allowed to not, you don't have to marry a language. And it's not monogamy with languages. You know, like when you're learning German as your foreign language, doesn't mean you can never, ever, ever learn Chinese. In fact, later on, when you've got the foundations down, you can take things further and do a bit of learning from your for, from your first foreign language into your second foreign language. And I've been practicing a lot like that. And it really helps you both maintain your, you know, language standards, but it also helps you, you know, keep your brain active. And it's a really, really cool challenge that it's never going to be open to you unless you pick one first. And finally, it is important to match your high motivation that you might have at the start with consistent and specific action. And I mentioned earlier the vision goal and the path goal. The vision goal is your desire that, and your image of yourself speaking a language. You know, really thinking, what will I be doing in this language a year from now, perhaps? What will I be doing in this language six months from now that, that gets me excited? What fires me up about this language? Your path goal is much, much, much more about how you get there. So that is really where you space things out, where you build your language learning plan, and you're thinking, well, what am I working on right now? Am I at level zero? Where do I want to be in four weeks? Where do I want to be in one week? What do I actually have time for? How busy am I? What can I do? And that is the way that you make that big, big vision goal realistic and doable, and you bring it in, and you start thinking about what actions am I actually going to take. So you do need both of them. And this is probably a good time to mention that I'm currently working on a language goal challenge, which will be coming to you through my newsletter, hopefully starting next week. And we're all going to be ready. And then there's going to be the coolest two new additions to the Language Habit Toolkit. So I'm relaunching that in just a few weeks and it will go away from sale, so you won't be able to buy it while it's offline being upgraded. So that is just really, really exciting. And the reason I mention this is because Language Habit Toolkit, kit, killed? The Language Habit Toolkit, product idea. The Language Habit Toolkit is designed to guide you through a, a structure of planning, tracking and reviewing and I suggest no matter whether you have it or not you follow that structure and planning is important planning is where you set yourself up for consistent action and then your tracking phase is where you just kind of you know you take those actions you make a note of when you've done them and I really have to tell you guys like this November which is rapidly just racing away from me I I noticed that I didn't take the time to set my specific language goals it's just been it's been crazy Halloween day is my husband's birthday so we're always all over the house um, all over the place in the house with that one and I just didn't sit down and think to myself well what do I want to achieve in November I'm still making progress because language habits mean you do do things automatically but I feel much less like I'm moving on a line you know I feel like I'm just doing bits and they're not really adding up because I didn't think about where I am and where I want to be. So this is really, again, from experience, a very, very heartfelt recommendation that that is something that you really need to do. And finally, I just want to say this again, you don't need a reason to learn a language. And at the same time, you, you can have a very, very specific reason, but don't pick it because you think you need one and you should have one. You can actually 
say I'm doing this for no reason because doing it for no reason usually means I'm doing it because I want to and that is a wonderful wonderful reason to learn a language so permission from me to pick whichever language attracts you most and my gut feeling from having read the very few words that you put in the post this goes to Enrique is uh, that Enrique may be happiest right now trying Arabic and if you change your mind in three weeks and you decide that you want to learn German after all no one will judge you for it absolutely go for it okay that's it from me really for today and I, I have very few links to put in the description so please just leave me your comments and answer me this question do you have a reason to keep going in your language what is your reason this week to keep going for me my reason is that I've already come so far and that is a big, big reason. I would love to hear yours. Uh, thank you so much if you tuned in live. It's been really, really cool to talk to you all. And uh, let me know what you think of this setup. I think we're going to fix it for next time again. <laughs>